So Amit, thanks for doing this. Uh, Thank you. I've been yeah. really looking forward to this. Um, partly, as as you know, because you were so important to my development as a music listener uh, uh, in Oxford in the mid '80s. Thank you. Yeah. And you know, I was very struck by the opening of your book, and maybe we should begin with that, which is you describe Indian classical music as almost a foreign territory that you know most indians encounter it almost as if they would encounter a foreign music you attribute it to the fact that uh, partly they listen to some very bad classical music uh, and they <laughs> therefore never get into the genre uh, but you also attribute it to a very technical feature of indian classical music namely its extreme tonalities and I just want to push you on that a bit. I mean, which is, you know, because the paradox in your opening is that on the one hand, you say this, on the other hand, you yourself, uh, throughout your life, um, have been extraordinarily receptive to all kinds of music with all kinds of weird tonalities in some ways. So is this, can you just explain a little bit more what you mean when you say Indian classical music is like a foreign country for most Indians, middle-class Indians? Sure. Um, and what you attribute it to. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Pratap. Um, I think there are many things of, that I'm trying to say here. I mean, some of it uh, involves self-examination to do with why, why I resisted this uh, kind of music for, for a period in my life and why people resist this music because I, otherwise everybody would be listening to Hindustani classical music. We, we, we know that it's a it's a it's a minority taste, you know, um, and and uh, but I also wanted to address uh, the kind of journey not only I but everyone makes uh, when when they towards something that they might finally embrace. So, uh, firstly, uh, 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 to say before I come to the uh, uh, to the reasons to do with what's intrinsic to the music itself. Uh, that might uh, uh, um, might be inaccessible on a first hearing to to a listener. I, I want to briefly address the fact that all art, even the seemingly uh, most uh, the simple form of art, is on some level inaccessible and and. Uh, It's a mistake to think that that what one can can access it without preparation or or, or contingency or or transformations taking place in one's life. So uh, a, a, a work of art might create a transformation in one's life. A transformation in one's life might be coterminous with one becoming receptive to a work of art. Um, it, it, it may not necessarily happen because you've been told that this is important or this is valuable. That, that re receptivity, receptivity doesn't happen as a result of being told that something is valuable. Now, let us say that we are told something is valuable, but we find no value in it. Our present uh, hegemony would tell us that in that case it's 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 a dead piece of the past and it should be thrown out only that which is immediately accessible to you and uh, that which Im makes immediately uh, uh, makes sense immediately uh, should be should be part of mm, your uh, what you're exposed to what you listen to what you read even part of your pedagogy um so while there is a there is there is a case to be made for rejecting things uh, that come come to you with with a preordained sort of endorsement of value uh, it is also important to realize the difficult process of a transformation that, that transformation always encounters uh, goes is, is it, one encounters a resistance in oneself prior to a transformation. So so uh, um, 
whether it's music or, as I said, whether it's a very simple piece of, of writing, it is true that at a certain point of our, in our lives, we will rediscover a value to it. Um, we might at a certain point in our lives also find valueless something that we've been told uh, was fantastic or something that we thought was fantastic. I I'm going to give you facile uh, examples. I mean, when I was 16 years old, I, th I did think that James Hadley Chase was a great writer. I'm giving you a, 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 a humorous example, you know, um, but maybe not 16, I, when I was 15 years old. When I, so, 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 of course, I mean, epochs pass in a year when you're that age. So at the age of 14 or 15, trying to be older than I was, I might have thought, James Hadley Chase is a fantastic writer. The following year, I might have thought James Joyce is, is a great writer. We, at the age of 16, I, I tried to read James Joyce. Uh, now, at, at the age of 16, I read, no, at the age of 17, I read a portrait of the artist as a young man and rejected it. At the age of 24, I reread it and suddenly realized I feel a deep affinity for this view of the world and language. Now, so what I'm talking about is the fact that there is a degree of contingency of accidentality here uh, and and also a degree of resistance um, one has to remember this remember the process of of learning is not just education in in the sense of something being given dropped down from above but a a, a kind of a, yeah a, a, a difficult uh, uh, experience of transformation then that then leads to something to the discovery of a, of a kind of pleasure that is very important i think we've forgotten that to a certain extent that is one of the things i was pointing towards no that's really important so, so, so let me just kind of um you know get you to elaborate on that a bit because there's sort of two things in what you just said um you know so th there's a joke we often say right that for you to be able to read a book well, there must be a you for the book to be able to read as well. I mean, it's in, in, in some senses, right? And so is that part of the process of coming to know this, uh, part of, in a sense, the development of yourself, your changing emotional resonances, in a sense, yourself must be able to contain the world such that then a piece of music becomes recept, you know, uh, uh, available to you. So there's that one kind of description you lay out. But you also sometimes suggest, and I think in your own biographical case, maybe uh, 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 that you also sort of say that it could also be just an epiphanic moment. That it's not that anything fundamentally changed about you between the ages of 16 and 20, but there is almost something ineffable, mysterious. Amit didn't grow. It's just that the music came to it at a slightly different angle. And if you could just describe in your case, which do you think it was, whether it was a part of your growing or in the book, it almost sounds like there was this epiphanic moment. You, you, you hear a particular rendition and you say, yes, this is, you know, generating an emotional resonance or, 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 or something that is entirely unexpected. I think, uh, uh, I, I think what you know, uh, uh, begins and extends itself and begins to take a particular shape that will then characterize your own exploration and your own journey rather than a journey set out for you by others which which might have been set out to you when you were growing up uh, um, when things that were right in front of you and and these were things you um, considered unimportant but or never looked at suddenly become important uh, and and uh, that is the process by which that happens uh, is is can only be put down to a certain openness and need um, suddenly occurring in your life. Um, which then leads to a radical evaluation, sorry, a re-evaluation of everything you thought you knew. Um, 
so whether it's to do with the ordinary I, I i use that word as a shorthand which then became the subject of my fiction but at the age of 20 not of my fiction my poetry at the age of 23 and the following year 24 when i began writing a strange and sublime address when when it became the subject of my fiction and my imagination uh, at the age of 17 i would not have thought what i'm calling loosely the ordinary what right what is right in front of oneself uh, uh, um, proper literary subject matter i i i would have thought that uh, you know uh, proper literary subject subject matter needs to be thematically demarcated and elevated in some way uh, i would not have thought that my uncle had it, taking a shower is, is is a proper subject for 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 writing, um, only a re revaluation within oneself about what is important as and what is unimportant can lead to such a decision, where you allow that that reality which is in front of you to be reimagined, which is what was happening in that book and hadn't happened until then. Similarly with music. Similarly with music, I mean. Um, those, uh, those those songs were there around me. Indian music was also in some way there around me. Indian vocal music was there around me, but I was uninterested in it. I began to become interested, like many others, in the sitar and sarod, and even replicated as a cousin of mine was reminding reminding me when I was about 13 or so, uh, snatches of Sindhi Bhairavi, because there was a I had a a record recording, famous live recording of Ali Akbar Khan and Ravi Shankar playing Rag Sindhi Bhairavi. Mm. Uh, I had that in my collection, uh, replicating uh, Sindhi Bhairavi on my guitar. But um, but what what the voice means, what khayal means, what singing actually means, might have been there before me. But um, the full force of that and what it would mean to kind of characterizing the next bit of my life. And nothing prepared me for that. Um, yeah. So, 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 you know, there's a, there's a philosophical idea, I mean, just to kind of, uh, again, elaborate on that point, which says that uh, the point about receptivity and creativity, as you said, is not about, in a sense, the content of what you're paying attention to. It is that moment of decision where you decide to pay attention to something. I mean, it's, 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 it's actually in a sense that, 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 that kind of almost precognitive moment, right? Uh, where it's the decision to attend to something that actually is in a sense at the originary source rather than the intrinsic properties of the thing in itself. And given that in a sense, we you know, face a multitude of choices, right? In music, in, in forms of writing, in objects worthy of att attention. The thing we are less self-conscious about is how and why we choose to pay attention to something, right? Um, uh, why does this ordinary become the object of your attention in a way in which let's say it wasn't. Um, both as a musician, as a writer, I mean, can you see yourself uh, uh, or, or, or can you describe how you come to that decision about what is it that you pay attention to? Or, or is, is, it, is that in some senses almost subconscious or unconscious? It is very difficult to give a coherent, rational kind of, uh, to provide a coherent, rational sort of narrative uh, about this. Um, I'm I'm not taking recourse to the sort of model that J.M. Kutsia follows in what is a classic when he says I I heard I overheard Bach in the uh, well-tempered clavier in the neighbor's house or kitchen or whatever I instantly realized it was a thing of great beauty uh, and that it was a classic. Then later on, I suspected my, my own response as to whether 
it was precisely because some part of me knew that it was a classic that I was being drawn to it. Right. As I've said, I mean, we avoided classical music and right. classical music came with a whole different set of ambiguities, cultural kind of ambiguities in, 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 in our culture, by which I mean middle class, uh, the middle, sort of middle class culture that I grew up in, uh, in, in Bombay. Um, and in that particular part of Bombay right. that I grew up in. Um, so uh, I cannot give you a, 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 a kind of rational uh, and coherent narrative about it, partly also because the narrative is a fairly unusual one, Pratap, in the sense that I then invested so much in it. You know, uh, um, I mean, all of us might discover Hindustani classical music. When I say us, again, I mean yeah. the educated middle class. Uh, and in fact, the educated middle class has played a great role in, uh, had played a great role in uh, recuperating, privileging this music uh, uh, and, and bringing it uh, and, the, and those musicians to the, to the, to the concert hall, uh, uh, giving it uh, uh, seriousness, although um, uh, no critical tradition of, of great seriousness as to, if we are honest about it, really emerged. But having said that, uh, relatively few people uh, from that background um, have invested uh, 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 lifelong uh, uh, the, the degree of invest, investment required uh, of a practitioner, of a serious practitioner. There are a few people. But but it, they're, they're in a very, very, very tiny minority. So uh, I don't have comparisons. Uh, I, I would like others to tell their stories about how that happened. But with me, there was no kind of uh, background to fall back on that my father was a great classical music aficionado or, or that kind of thing. My mother, of course, was a great singer, uh, but of the Tagore song. Uh, so... Um, I have to put it down uh, to, again, to suddenly discovering a particular kind of beauty through, through what my, my mother's teacher, who had just begun to teach her in 1978, Pandit Govind Prasad Jaipur was doing, uh, and also discovering those kind of uh, little snatches of rag and melody that I heard from Kishori Amonkar in uh, Pratibha, Pratibha Ani Pratima, that morning, Sunday morning program, and Bhimsen Joshi. And, and to allow myself to learn, to, to understand, by learning, I mean to allow myself to realize that I was being moved by this, and, and then to take the reckless plunge. Mm -hmm. uh, can I go further into this? I, 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 I should have maybe, or I could have stopped over there and allowed myself to remain as a listener, but then I decided to take the plunge and go further. Um, so, so, you know, th th I didn't even know what I was doing, Pratap, uh, uh, in the sense that, yeah, uh, uh, I had no idea what I was getting into, and I can say that of everything I've done. Uh, okay, maybe we'll come to that point towards the end. Uh, um, so, you know, your book is, I mean, it's, it's remarkably rich. I think, you know, there's a, there's a new idea uh, almost in every paragraph um, uh, about music, about the relationship between music and self. And I just want to pick on a couple of the major themes, maybe get into the more substantive part rather than the, uh, 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 just how you sort of um, came to be a musician. So you have a fascination with um, the alap, uh, both in a sense as a, a part of performance, but also, also as a metaphor, right? Uh, in some senses, this idea of something that, uh, a rag that still has a potential existence in an alap, it hasn't sort of settled into that linear structure that most ordinary listeners associate with in some sense as a rag. Um, it's also very distinctive of alaps in some senses that no two alaps are identical. I mean, in, I mean by and large, it's generally true, arguably, of, 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 of Khayal in some ways that no, no two renditions are identical, right? Right. Even and, by the same singer of the same rag on two 
uh, on consecutive dates. Right, right, exactly. And and you know, Mukun Lat. I mean, of course, the the, the great musicologist once um, uh, you know wrote this wonderful line that in some senses that one of the interesting things about both alaps and, 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 and particularly the rag form is that the identity of a rag is maintained uh, uh, not despite change, but because of the necessary change that the execution of that rag requires, right? That in some senses, there is, a, if you like, a principle of difference, uh, uniqueness built into every performance of that rag. Now, one, do you agree with it in a sense that characterization and is that part what partly what draws you to uh, uh, the Srag form and the Alap in particular? But second, if that is the case, then does the what does it do to the category of innovation and modernism in Indian music? I mean, you have a wonderful chapter which will perhaps come to later about these three wonderful moments of modernism in 19th century Indian art in some senses, both in Khyal, in painting, um, and in Kathak. But if the form itself in some senses, right, uh, tries to pull off this unique thing of maintaining an identity through, in a sense, a, a difference, and always uh, focusing your attention on the potential existence is even more important, if you like, than the real existence of the rag. How does one think of sort of you know, innovation, modernism, those kinds of categories in the context of Indian classical music at all. So, uh, um, um, can, I completely agree with what you said so far about about potential existence, and I and I agree with the quote from Mukund Lat as well. Can you tell me what you have in mind when you say innovations and modernism? No, no. So, so, so for example, so you know. Um, you have this very intriguing historical thesis, just to make it concrete, that in the 19th century, Indian art is on the verge of a new kind of modernism. You pick out the example of Maharaja Man Singh of Jodhpur, uh, a figure I've been actually been interested in. He was also an art yogi in some ways. Uh, uh, and there's an innovation in the figurative painting. Uh, you talk about Vajir Ali Shah's kind of innovation in Tumri uh, in, in, you know, in some ways, uh, and Mohammad Shah's innovation in Khyal. And you present the 19th century as this moment where a certain kind of modernistic innovation is appearing in Indian art. Right. Um, and I was just trying to understand that given in a sense that this is an art form that doesn't quite repeat itself because it's not mimetic, it's not representative. Uh, why, what do you think is special that is happening in the 19th century, that we think of it as a distinctive kind of innovation, as opposed to innovation just being the generalized condition of this art form in some ways? Okay. Um, so when I, when I make uh, this comparison to modernism, uh, uh, Pratap, um, Again, I'm bringing to, to the book, to the khayal, and to my understanding of it as I write the book, everything that I know and I am. Uh, um, as, a, as, in, as, an, uh, as a writer, as a musician, as a practitioner, as a person who reads uh, and who reads certain things more than he reads other things, and who listens to certain things more than he listens to other things. So as I said earlier, I found myself listening more and more to uh, uh, within within Hindustani classical music to Khayal. Um, I the, the 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 kind of opportunity to listen to, to to instrumental music was always there, and it's not as if instrumental music doesn't have its its own expansive um, uh, explorations. But it is the it is the explorations in the khayal that most attractive. So if I had a chance to listen to his, uh, to a classical music, uh, sorry, uh, to, to khayal or to a sitar uh, performance, I would always go for khayal. Um, so why? Yeah. Similarly, I was drawn as a writer, uh, sorry, as a reader uh, to poetic forms rather than narrative forms. Um, I, I saw 
the 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 the, the the marginalization, the increasing marginalization of poetry as a genre under capitalism, when poetry lists began to close down with, with major publishing houses, uh, with 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 utter, utter utter dismay. Even in prose fiction, I was drawn to the more non-narrative put potentials of prose fiction, both as a writer and as a reader. I come back to this this idea of the reader because because uh, there were there were many phases of this discovery in myself. Uh, so when I was editing the Picador book of modern Indian literature, once again I discovered uh, what a rich um, tradition of modernity and non-narrative experiment there was in Indian writing, and and this is what drew me further into it as a kind of uh, a time of learning about the fact that Indian literary history from the 19th and 20th century must not only be identified with authenticity and nation. In fact, one must leave those things aside and look at form, time, space, the sensuous uh, kind of dimensions of experience and language. and and for the want of a better word, modernism, non-narrative experience. Mm -hmm. All of this I'm bringing to this book when I discuss Khayal. I cannot help it. I'm not bringing it because I want to bring it in. But this is obviously who I am. And, and, and it directs what I see, especially, you know, this book is not a, just an act of writing. It's, a, it's, a, it's an act of trying to illuminate to myself things which are coming to light as I'm writing or which I've thought about in some form. Uh, before I wrote, but never really fully investigated. Them. So even as I'm writing, I'm, bring, I'm bringing more and more of myself and what I know into the writing. And one of these things has to do with my idea of the emergence of these uh, non-narrative uh, or non-representational mm -hmm. forms and how they occur in India and in music and in art and why I'm drawn to these. You know, there is also that. So the, 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 so so I'm noticing Bulaki, and I'm noticing uh, that in Mansing Scott he's trying to represent. He's been commissioned to represent a kind of emptiness, mm. and for the first time, it, you know, this I discovered. On this, these paintings I only discovered seven or eight years ago, in in London yeah. during the Garden and Cosmos ex exhibition. So now this comes back to me in relation to the khayal. And, and what I understand of the khayal also comes back to me, but this I've felt for a long time about the khayal, that something is happening there which is not unrelated to a temper that I found in literature as well, which is a freeing up of things. You see, Pratap, one of the things that, one of the Western limitations of understanding modernism is to see that fracturing or that unshackling as some kind of effect of historic trauma or an allegorizing of historic trauma. That you know things are fragmented in in form, in poetic uh, form or in literature because the world was becoming fragmented. But I, I think that the, the the fragmentation is a, is a freeing, uh, is an unshackling of the form from from the usual grammar, syntax, and conventions of representation and realism. And so there is a great deal of joy in modernism for me, a great deal of enchantment in modernism and in these non-narrative forms for me. And I can see that this is this kind of freedom and this, this liberation is also taking place here. Uh, some of it is taking place in these, in these uh, cross-cultural moments as modernism is. Uh, in 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 the Indian literatures, in Indian languages, um, I mean, Western modernism is also taking place in a cross-cultural moment, where they where after having grown up with with the kind of hyper-realistic uh, kind uh, uh, rules and regulations of the Renaissance or Neoclassicism, Enlightenment, they're suddenly coming into contact with China, Japan, India, etc. And uh, that that creates the possibility of this unshackling that I'm talking about. 
it's not it's not some response as western critics love to put it to, to some breakdown in their society it is it is a response to these non representational non narrative forms which they are coming into contact with so modernism is taking place in that cross cultural moment khayal must also be part of some some sort of churning some sort of mix but because it's music and because we don't pay that kind of attention to it we somehow think it's immemorial this is was always like this but it is part of a historical moment um it must be part of this wider mix where this wonderful freedom is taking place uh a, a, what can only be called an artistic innovative avant-garde and i'm not saying that in a kind of teenagerish way uh freedom from the usual conventions of form uh allowing a new kind of spiritual expansiveness and joy i speak about the latter because that is where my interest lies if anything uh it is in in this ability to be joyous to celebrate which i think our culture has and our music has and uh, um and i see i see i put khayal in in that context of unshacklement and uh, and enchantment and reenchantment it is it is it is an astonishingly enchant enchanting form where enchantment takes place in a state of seeming stasis right. nothing seems to be happening right. especially if you're a lay listener or if you're if you are a western listener from a, 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 a european listener from the 19th or 20 early 20th century you'll say oh this music is constantly repetitive i mean nothing is going on over there uh, quite uh, quite the opposite of what you say mukund lat is saying yeah, yeah, yeah. that every performance is actually a new performance mm -hmm. so to the lay listener it sounds like a state of stasis we know it is a state of innovation of re constant rejuvenation constant reimagining now all of this can be placed at some something that is happening at this time which comprises in the arts a, a moment of reenchantment but but but, but, but uh, let, let's pick on that theme because it it you know it's it's it, you you kind of deal with it magnificently in the book um by perhaps looking at two contrasts you draw in the book right so one is i mean you have this wonderful discussion of your reaction to beethoven um and sort of beethoven's i and and you know uh, i mean i have very limited knowledge and acquaintance of western classical music but but, but yeah. the cycle of beethoven symphonies that you describe i have exactly the same reactions uh, to fifth sixth especially the pastoral yeah but the I contrast you draw can you just speak uh, i can hear you but it's a little soft okay okay sorry um so yeah. the the contrast you draw is between Beethoven's music as in a sense falling in the space of representation mimesis and a certain kind of progression it's a certain kind of narrative in some senses yeah. uh, and what it brings to mind is literally in a sense pictures in some senses in the pastoral right. and the gardens yeah. and the waters right and you in a sense juxtapose that against the khayal form uh, as this kind of non narrative uh, uh, non linear in some ways non representational uh 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 forms of music that in some senses make the world erupt as it were through just the linguistic articulation of the musical articulation so one i actually just want to ask you you know as an ideal type this contrast obviously makes sense from kind of a heuristic perspective to think about but how sharp is this divide i mean you know because one of the things in beethoven's scholarship in particular right uh it is often said that in fact people often make this contrast between mozart and beethoven that mozart has that narrative progression the sense of the contingency of here and now and telling a story whereas beethoven is a sense is not mimetic i mean it it actually does lead you to a point of transcendence at some level that point which in a sense then escapes all the representations of it So one I just want to ask you how sharply do you want to play on this sort of east west contrast to oversimplify it um and the second follow up question oh actually, actually why don't you take this one and then maybe I'll come to the second one okay um so one i need to sort of point out a couple of things as as kind of a qualification first is the first is that i'm not 
by any means a, an expert very far from it on western or uh, european classical music however whenever i've heard it i have uh, made mental notes uh, because of the various traditions of music that i have been exposed to affecting me in in different ways um secondly i'm i'm also not saying that it is the intention of the music or the composer uh, to to in in western music or or in beethoven's case to be representational um although having said that uh, beethoven does tie uh, the pastoral number 6 symphony number 6 to a program so he gives it a narrative of sorts spring storm gathering of village folk etc etc he he so he understands although he is on the cusp of romanticism where the kind of uh the the, the representational quality is to do with mood uh an atmosphere will take over in a, as far as the listener and the lay listener is concerned um he he's on the cusp of romanticism but uh, uh, he still is enough formed by culture enlightened cult enlightenment culture the narrative of the human maybe poetry and picture, picture uh, poetry uh, I, i don't know uh to I don't know enough about the history of that music to do something quite different from, say, Bach. Right. In in order to tie the music with a with a represent a series of representational idea. In the case of the pastoral, then his own Ninth Symphony gets kind of allegorized by the first by his first listeners into a a, a story of a journey uh, right. into triumph. because by that time the, the basic enlightenment narrative is in place to do with man's journey um so it is possible that 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 great western musicians great european musicians do not when they compose com- uh, they don't they aren't thinking fundamentally in terms of narrative but it is very very difficult i would say for a person from that time to have completely escaped the the narrative dimensions of 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 the music that they are com- composing in the musical tradition they're composing in and contributing to in terms of you know articulating that narrative dimension um difficult to do it now pratap one of the ways in which that representational dimension is critiqued is by people who come later by like schonberg who bring in a 12 tone or a, a music the scale or a tonal uh, music but even there the the allegorizing tendencies of 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 the educated mind is such that then that becomes the representational of mm. some kind of internal dissonance or societal dissonance or trauma you know um so to listen to western music without any non without any representational residue mm. uh, we would need to radically uh, uh re-educate ourselves mm-hmm. in terms of how to listen mm-hmm. it it would be a long long process mm-hmm. i'm not even sure whether everybody would want to take part in that process sure. whether they would think that reading uh, uh, western music of all narrativity mm-hmm. is desirable mm-hmm. now with with indian music rag thodi does not create a, a a kind of narrative in your head mm-hmm. in terms of it being sad joyous etc mm-hmm. it it becomes really a form of meditation in the morning 
but it, it can only be undertaken in the morning. It is a, it, it involves a kind of acknowledgement and praise of the fact of mourning. Right. Is one one more kind of cognizance of this fact, of the, of these hours in which Tori is sung, and then of course it is a cognizance of the notes of the rag and in the ways in which they can be approached. That hasn't stopped Tori occasionally being used for sad scenes in Hindi cinema. Right. Um, but here the 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 the, the kind of problem is the opposite no, it's not a problem but here we have only a, a kind of um, an, a small instance of of a rag being used in that narrative kind of way in cinema mm. um, were we to now begin to listen to all the rags in a narrative way we would again radically need to re re-educate ourselves but but, 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 but Amit, i mean what about the ramcharit manas right i mean you, you since you actually both write about poetic forms and music right i mean in some senses uh, again, to to a kind of amateurish take on it, uh, 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 the compositions are meant to be sung to particular rags, and there is a narrative structure. In fact, in 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 the case of Ramcharit Manas, a very self-conscious kind of man narrative structure. Um, you give examples in the book of, I mean, a, a figure that seems to fascinate you, Mira. Uh, I assume partly because of the kind of resonance with the Kuvar Sham Gharana from which you are. Um, uh, Again, on an amateurish take, you might say there is actually a kind of blending of both the narrative form uh, with the musical form. Uh, yes, ultimately, in the final analysis, the most important thing, as you say, is uh, the way it brings out the dignity of the human emotion. But even that is a journey in some ways. I mean, there is, there is you know, there's the autobiographical journey of Mira. Um, uh, but there's also almost a kind of process by which you come to that form where the dignity of that emotion is realized. So, I, I mean, I'm just kind of trying to push you, push you from the other end, which is, is it as simple that this is actually non-representational? Um, in, uh, if a Tulsi Das bhajan was sung to a rag or a Kabir, uh, you know, Doha or, or a Mira bhajan, then you know, you know, certain some of those songs have set tunes, which are, uh, which are rags. Uh, but, uh, but, but, um, whatever the narrative uh, 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 being explored by those songs, especially Mira, I mean, there is a narrative going on often to do with the Rana and to do with Krishna, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, but, uh, um, whether the rag is doing anything in terms of Contributing to the narrative, I don't know, but but as a rag, let us say the rag is Yemen yeah. in that case. Then uh, um, I cannot think that it has a an appropriate narrative quality that fits that those particular words. Uh, it, it's been put to those uh, uh, those words have been set to that rag maybe, but uh, take away the words, and I cannot think that. Listening to Yemen, I think that these are the words that I uh, should sort of be setting to Yemen in a way that it would be very difficult for me to uh, play a major scale tune in a scene in a film. In which a death has occurred. Right. Uh, um, in in that sense, since we, we since you know since we have uh, used the analogy of death, I'm trying to think of a funeral situation or a shrad mm. situation, mm. saying that uh, so the 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 or the the choice of the bhajans or, or songs that are sung then would be determined by the lyrics right. but uh, but i cannot imagine somebody saying but you cannot uh, you know sing that particular lyric in in rag desh or rag bilawal please avoid those rags mm. I, I cannot think that happening right um, yeah i mean although I, I think it is historically i think it's an interesting question whether particularly when tulsi is particularly the ramcharit manas whether they actually think the choice of rag and the choice of shastra, as it were, is is actually purely contingent. 
Um, but um, so let me kind of pick out one. Yeah, obviously, a, a journey being made from the rag being a folk tune or a chant or, 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 or you know, uh, a, a kind of repeated set of notes that used in a temple uh, uh, to, 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 to repeat, to, to sing lines in a particular meter. Uh, uh, from, from that to have become uh, the, 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 the object of that kind of imaginative ex exploration itself is, a, is an extraordinary uh, cultural phenomenon right. and partly a modernistic phenomenon as well. Right. So, so uh, let's take an example from your book, and I, I, you know, want you to speak to this. Um, you, you talk about Amir Khan, uh, um, Ustad Amir Khan, um, and particularly uh, his rendering of Ram Dasi Malhar as sort of uh, one of, in a sense, the high points uh, of Khayal. Um, can you? explicate what that particular conjunction of him singing Ram Dasi Malhar meant to you and what it actually means in the history of Khayal. I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's one of the few moments where you say, if, if a person was meant to personify a rag, this is it. Uh, so perhaps using that example to bring, bring together these different themes that we've been talking about. Right, right. So uh, others have played or sung Ram Dasi Malhar, of course. Um, some of these have become more available to us uh, from private recordings on YouTube, etc. But when I was growing up and when I first began to listen to Hindustani classical music, and even today, I would say Ram Dasi Malhar is an unusual rag, uh, if not a rare rag. I mean, when I was growing up, it was definitely a rare rag. Uh, um, I hardly ever heard it performed. There were no recordings of it available. Right. Uh, there was no Ram Dasi Malhar in our gharana being sung. Right. Although the although our, our gharana had many rare varieties of Malhar because Kumar Sham used to experiment with creating these Jod rags, especially in the Malhar variety. So we had Kafi Malhar, uh, Sugrai Malhar, Suha Malhar, which I sang, which I recorded as well. Yeah. But Ram Dasi Malhar, I discovered through a uh, through the festival of India uh, uh, recordings. Right. You remember there was this festival of India, of India yes. kind of thing. Uh, right. yes. When was it? In the, in the early 80s? When I can't remember when it was exactly. Yeah, in the 80s, I think, yeah. Uh, 82, 83 or something, yeah. It must have been around then. So, uh, um, so I was, I was I was listening to Hindustani classical music, and, and and at that point I was still not as taken with Amir Khan as I am today. Right. Um, also partly because what we got to hear were these recordings which were done in a studio format. Uh, his Marwa Darbari. Uh, which was sung not in the prime of his kind of, of his of his kind of time as a singer at a time when he was still a wonderful singer but i think one needed to have heard the whole journey of amir khan to 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 appreciate those studio recordings which maybe hmb had done uh, with with characteristic uh or, or or kind of lack of conviction at a time when the reputation was established, but the voice was kind of no mm. longer in, in, in the best form. You know, in those, in that era, the, the, when, when Khayal singers were recorded, when they were at the peak of their form, it was usually not by HMB, but by Inreco or Hindustan Records. That's right. um, there may be exceptions to this. Um, so, so I went to Rhythm House and there you, you had the option of listening to a record before you bought it or even listening to a record and not buying it. Mm. So because there was this option available, of course, we were looked upon with, uh, with a lot of suspicion by, by the staff. 
you know, when we took our records in. So one of the records that I took in was was the Festival of India compilation. Yeah. There I heard Ram Dasi Malha. And I thought, this is extraordinary and this is, this is the most beautiful Amir Khan recording that I've heard till now. It is an extraordinary rag and I began to sing it. I was singing it when, when I was in Oxford. I remember Chandra Shekhar Khare, right. a mathematician, right. came to Oxford up, I think after you had left, right. asking me to sing this rag when we were on Broad Street in front of the uh, Sheldonian. Right. <laughs> because he, he too, like me, loved the two Gandhars, right. Komal and Shushu. Right. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I went up to the sign, came down and touched both Gandhars. He wanted me to do that. So it was a demonstration on Broad Street. And, and the man in front of us turned and looked. And he said, that's my, my supervisor. He loves music. This is what yeah. Chandra Shekhar Khare said to me. Yeah. Um, this Ram Dasi Malhar, of course, came to me from Ustad Amir Khan. Yeah. I wanted to talk about the fact that Raga's weight yeah. for people. We, we know that. Mm. Even Marwa, mm. uh, what Amir Khan did to it, mm. there were many others, of mm. course. But what Amir Khan did to it was uh, was um, give its strangeness a kind of centrality. Mm. Did mm. not shy away from it. Said this extraordinary strangeness is is central to the way we are thinking in Khayal. That's mm. the statement he would have made mm. by giving it such centrality in his herb. So this whole business of the interpreter creating an intellectual intervention is very, um, is, is something that we can study mm. in, in, in the choices Amir Khan makes. So, 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 so what is the rag that was waiting for Amit Chaudhary? <laughs> <laughs> if you had to, if you had to guess one, I, I, I know your modesty will prevent you from answering this question, but just for the fun of it. That's not. I can't even. I can't talk about. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, I, I know we are running out of time, but um, since you're talking about sort of your Oxford days and you know walking in front of the Sheldonian, and, and, and I'm trying to picture the sight of sort of you know uh, 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 you singing Ram Dasi Malhar there. Uh, in your book, your stay in England, particularly as a student undergraduate, first oh, yeah. in London, and then as a graduate student in Oxford. Yes. Uh, you always get the sense that your experience in England redefined your relationship to Indian art forms in very many different ways. Uh, mm -hmm. And so how would you, in a sense, characterize the ways in which that experience redefined or brought to your attention? Um, uh, different ways in which you looked at Indian art forms you were already familiar with, uh, whether it's in poetry, whether it's in, 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 in music. Mm -hmm. um, certainly it does seem to induce a great degree of self-consciousness in what you do. I mean, uh, I think you kind of describe quite vividly what it is to look at yourself through kind of the eyes of subway commuters in London looking at you, right? Um, so what does that sort of that self-consciousness do to you? I mean, what have you found that debilitating or, or actually a creative force in thinking about both your music and your writing? This deserves a kind of uh, good answer on several levels. I'll, let me try and sort of give you one. First, the first is to say that the self-consciousness had to do with how unself-conscious I had been prior to going to England, you know. Uh, that, that was the primary self-consciousness. Then the, the other self, uh, the, and this kind of applied not to only, to only to the way I looked and the color of my skin, but, but uh, to, to, the, to the music I was then practicing and, and humming from time to time. And as I say in my book, I suddenly became, became aware that the sounds I was producing when I was practicing or humming to myself in an Indian restaurant were alien and even funny to, uh, to the English people two tables away. Um, but I was also becoming aware that I, my humming was being noticed and I was being noticed in a way that had never happened to me on, a, on the Bombay local. For instance, when I was taking the, the local train from Bandra to, uh, to Churchgate. So I could, I could be singing away, humming to myself and the person opposite me would be half distracted and not, not notice 
or barely notice. And I thought this, this, this culture of semi-distraction was formative to me. This culture of focus, I suffer in it and from it. And I think others suffer in it as well. I think these people who are so focused in, in, on the tube are, 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 are oppressed uh, uh, by, by this sense of focus, which is why they're looking at me in that particular way, startled uh, in a way that oppresses them. Mm. And, I, and I, I, I guess I'm being, I was being Laurentian and Lawrence himself was being, was beholden to one of the people he was, uh, he learned a lot from that is Nietzsche who, who talks about this constant curse of the Western consciousness or the modern Western consciousness of ironical self-consciousness. Right. So if anything, I became aware of the importance of the open window, the importance of distraction in India via sounds coming in from outside. And then I discovered, of course, that our music is integral to the sense of openness, to the sense of commerce. Mm. With, with It is not about a concert hall. It is not about focus in that sense. There is a sense of commerce in it with the world that is that is uh, that 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 creates its context and meaning, and this also became important to me as far as my writing was concerned. That my writing not just be a, a, about interiority and character, but it, that it be in some way uh, that it accommodate my sense of the world, of being in the world. Um, so there was there was that. The, the other thing I'd like to add is that I was doing. I I realized it yesterday when I was thinking of having that of, of having this conversation with you I mean because I was thinking of what going thinking of the time you know us going back to Oxford etc and which I, I haven't actually described the Oxford uh, kind of years in this book but I have the arrival into England and into London um, if it doesn't seem like too much of an exaggeration I would say that I was in an unprecedented situation, Prata. Right. I mean, I was black practicing Khayal right. in 1983 right. to that extent, spending, going back and spending as much as, uh, time possible I could in India to, to the extent that even today, uh, I, I do not qualify for permanent residence in Britain after having spent all those years there right. because of all the time I spent in India. And one of the reasons was music and my attachment to the country, which also came to me partly from music. Um, so undertaking the, those journeys and doing that kind of practice mm. over there in, in, in an, an environment that was alien and which found my, which found my music alien, mm. practicing to the extent that the outcome of that practice and, and, and those years is evident, is there now uh, in, there are eight recordings from 1988 from a concert that I, where, uh, songs that I performed shortly after my guru died that, that year, 1988. He died in February. This is from June. Those uh, those recordings of me singing Mira Paga uh, Ghungru uh, Mira Nachire, or uh, my own, uh, the melody I composed for the Mira Bhajan, Barse Bundia Saban Ki. A mix, mix of Miyaki Malhar and God Malhar, um, and A Porobashi Robe Ke Tagore Stappa. Uh, those are taken from the 90, 1988 concert. I was still in, 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 I was then in Oxford. By 88, I was in Oxford. Yeah. You heard me sing Poori yeah. and yeah. Bagishri that year in, in Oxford. 1989, uh, I recorded Puriya Dhanashri and Jog Bahar. Those recordings are also available now. Uh, those are studio recordings. Um, I was singing in that way. I was having to kind of do that practice, thinking about what I was doing while uh, doing that PhD, first doing the first degree in Oxford and the PhD, in, first degree at UCL and the PhD in Oxford, and then beginning to write a strange and sublime address, which I finished in 1988. Um, the situation was unprecedented, uh, Pratap. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had no, I had nothing to look back to as a model that, you know, okay, that guy managed to do it in this way. 
so I can I can follow I can do it in this way over here. The, 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 uh, I had I had nothing to fall back on in in those terms. It it was a it was an experiment, and it was very. Uh, it was it was demanding in a particular kind of way. I now see in hindsight, and it has continued to be demanding. Mm. It is it is it is it has continued to be demanding, especially in a in a cultural milieu which I don't know where where there seems to be such a sharp divide between the practitioner and the person who thinks about art and practice. Mm. It is very demanding. So. So I know we're running out of time. So let me kind of end with perhaps one last question, maybe to tie these themes together. Um, so you have this interesting, you know, remark, which is absolutely true and insightful. That one of the best things the British did to us was uh, they did not understand any Indian music, and so they did not try to do funny things with it, right? And you just said something which you know I resonate with that. At an emotional level, if one thinks of one's identification with India, I mean, in a sense, what comes to my music is probably uh, the most pervasive medium in some senses. I mean, and I'm not talking in terms of sort of authentic, uh, authentic identity or something. It's just the medium, as it were, through which um, you actually conjure up in India, the distracted India, the India that is in no need of justification. Uh, the India that in, in some senses is already modernist and non-representational. I mean, all the, all the wonderful things in the sense you talk about, right? Um, so one, I just wanted to ask you that at this historical juncture, and I know you're often reluctant to answer kind of in historical terms and, and rightly so, I think as an artist, but at this historical juncture, um, do you see in some senses um, uh, the power of that music to kind of evoke in India in all of these manifestations that you have sort of talked about in the book are diminishing or being put at risk by something that you hadn't anticipated 20, 30 years ago. That uh, perhaps that space that we thought of as music, right? Uh, allowing us to define our own relationship to the world, uh, letting music read us as we read music. Um, actually this, you know this this this, 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 um, this almost multilinguisticness. You yourself are, uh, I mean, fluent in Marathi, Bengali. Not uh, fluent in Marathi. Let me correct you there. So, you know, or or at least you 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 grew up listening to Marathi music. Uh, I think yeah, I think that's probably more more, more, more you know more, you know. I read this, it was part of one of the things I rediscovered. A yeah. Accurate. Uh, so how do you think of this relationship between, as it were, music and your relationship to India now? as perhaps compared to 25, 30 years ago, has there been a significant change? Is there something you worry about in that relationship? I'm very worried. Mm. I'm, I'm very, very worried. Of course, on a larger uh, kind of, uh, on, a, on, a, on the level of talking about uh, where we are today as a country, of course, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply anxious. Uh, but, uh, But on a, on a more intimate and very fundamental cultural level, to me fundamental, to I think all of us, to do with the imagination and the indispensability of the imagination, uh, I, am, I am extremely worried. Um, and here, I would say it's a general problem. Uh, I, I I wouldn't I I wouldn't put it only at the door door of the right yeah. or the far right. Yeah. I think there's been a general failure, yeah. uh, and part of the general failure is our our inability to understand the nature of this failure, yeah. to come to terms with it, to even acknowledge it. And it is always a kind of convenient shorthand to to ascribe it to uh, uh, the political ugliness that has come to reign yeah. over our lives, the the uh, unforeseeable in the past political ugliness that is now 
quickly becoming the norm for many people. And it is, is, is deeply worrying, but if there were subsets mm -hmm. over here, however difficult it, it is for them, it would be for them to exist of free thinking in culture, mm -hmm. independent, courageous, truthful, open thinking in culture, then there would be some reason for optimism. Right. I think of the colonial period in India as a period of great optimism in spite of yeah. the colonial rulers being present because of the extraordinary courage shown not only politically but in thought and creativity by our artists right. at that time. The, 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 the courageousness did not take place through, uh, through a kind of expression of political revulsion against the colonizer. Right. It, 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 it wasn't as easy as that. Yeah. They created new ways of thinking about the arts, about music, right. about, about uh, uh, literature, about right. performance, drama, dance. All this was done by our people right. at that time when the colonizer was present. Now, let us say we have a kind of extreme colonial presence taking control of our country. I, I would feel optimistic if, if, if there were expressions not only of free speech, but of, of the creation of new ways of thinking about creativity, which now seem to have given way which seem to have given way, it doesn't, they don't exist anymore. Um, this, I, this, I find, this I find worrying. I mean, um, to go back to Ustad Amir Khan and, and his contemporaries and others, uh, not just vocalists, instrumentalists, they, they, they were not just people who, did what they did because they were very talented. Right. But that, that, that's a very infantile way of looking at it. Yeah. Or they somehow were rooted in the culture which produced them. Mm -hmm. They changed the culture. Mm -hmm. To change the culture, to change the khayal in that way, in such an influential way, right. requires immense courage to, to, to understand that the change was taking place and that it was an important change requires a, a, an audience, a populace that is also courageous. Yeah. Um, today, there is, since we're talking about music, right. th there is an intellectual vacuum mm. in that sphere. Mm. Uh, the, the, the gossip always reigned in it, but now right. I don't know uh, what, whether there is very much else over there. Right. Music is not just about doing reyas, making some music, composing a song, doing a program or two, and then the rest of the time not thinking about it and, and gossiping, uh, uh, thinking about musicians to the extent that we gossip about them. It is a way of life. Right. And, and it is a way of life at a particular point in history. At each point in history, one redefines that way of life. Right. Now it has become a parody of people pulling their ears, wearing uh, particular kinds of clothes, doing pranam, etc., etc. It has become a theater of, 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 of gestures. Uh, uh, um, the, the whole business of being true to where we are now and, and what is missing in our discourse right. is not being uh, taken on. Mm by people. I may be wrong about this. I hope I'm wrong. But to me, this, this, this is worrying. This is deeply worrying. Also, just the one last thing, mm -hmm. which I've talked about in passing in the, in the book. Um, the, the, the casual dismissal with which we put to one side the whole business of nuance, of nuanced understanding of beauty, in the interests of simpler categories like success mm. from the 80s onwards, that yeah. is. Yeah. 
uh, when those ghazal singers suddenly became predominant. Right. Uh, I think if this has happened everywhere in the world. There has been an assault on those nuanced forms of beauty that art is capable of expressing. There have been many ideological assaults on it, including from the left, some of which I uh, uh, um, empathize with to a certain extent, as these being elite preoccupations. But what we're left with is nothing. Right. Uh, we are, the cost is great. Uh, um, it has political ramifications. It, 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 it allows people to appropriate whole parts of culture right. as, as Trump did with nation or Americanness, as a BJP do, is doing with Hinduism, right. without any real kind of uh, counter attack to it that can only come with an understanding of the ambiguity and nuanced quality of what it is that we are speaking about. What it is that we are cherishing. If we if we don't want to cherish the, those more fragile things anymore, mm. uh, then then it's only an empty kind of gesture made on behalf of an abstract idea called freedom of speech or right. whatever. Right, right. No, 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 thank. I mean, look, you know, you have across so many different genres. Uh, I think uh, uh, not only expanded the horizons of our imagination, but I think. In some senses, I mean, I, I always personally thought that actually the, the real seat of freedom is actually the imagination, it's not reason. And um, I think thanks for uh, reminding us for that. So one last personal question. Um, I know this is a cheesy question, but both of you grew up, both of us grew up listening to radio, particularly BBC radio. So in that spirit, um, if you had to recommend two recordings, one of Amit Chaudhary, uh, the, 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 the one recording that you are in a sense proud that you say, yes, this is me, or this is how I'd like to uh, be remembered. And one desert island disc in the Khyal genre. Uh, what, what, what would you pluck out at this moment of, you know, uh, that, that would resonate with you? Um, this is a... Uh, 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 a difficult question, especially the first part of the first question. I mean, the first part of the question, um, I, uh, simply because, uh, um, anyway, um, since you've asked it of me, maybe Jog Bahar, there I have two, uh, two recordings which I'm equally uh, fond of. Uh, one, as I said, which I did when I was still in Oxford, I went to Calcutta in 1989, but the other one is from 1994. When I was still in Oxford, but uh, but no longer a student, um, and it has the fuller uh, um, um, exposition of Jog Bahar. It has Dilambit Khyal, Drut Khyal, and Tarana. Yeah. Tarana is a very difficult yeah. Tarana. It is a showcase of Lakshman Prasad's extraordinary yeah. imagination in melody and line. So I would say that one because it's a good recording, um, and uh, with. With Khayal, Desert Island yeah. uh, uh, choice. Um, it would it would be between uh, Kishori Amonkar and Amir Khan. Today, uh, let me. What should I say? Let me say, there is a live recording of Kishori Amonkar uh, singing Shudhanat. Okay. Mm. Uh, and there is another live recording, an audio recording of her singing uh, Tilak Kam Kamod. Mm, yeah. uh, so I'm, I'm cheating and I'm giving you two of Kishori Omonkar. So those two for today. That's today's choice. Thank you, uh, Paramita. I assume we are out of time. So thank you so much, Amit, for helping us finding the rag or at least pointing us in the right direction where we may all Absolutely. find our rag. Thank you so much.